Uh, firstly, th uh, thank you for joining. Um, I know it's sort of towards the end of the day. Hopefully we'll do our best to uh, answer the questions uh, that we had posed as part of the session. I'm Ollie Browning, I'm the VP of EMEA for Go One, uh, and I'm here today really for sort of unpack two questions. So uh, all around developing the learning content strategy. We're a content aggregation business, so spend our day working with content providers and customers, so I have a fairly strong opinion on that. But more specifically, recently we've done some research with Fosway. So I really want to sort of surface to, to answer two questions. Why do we think this is relevant and what's the data telling us about why we should be doing this? Uh, and then try and answer some of the questions and give some tips as to how to go about doing that. Um, so, but really through this lens, so sort of when we wrote the brief, it was really to try and look at a couple of things. So um, why is digital learning non-negotiable? You might say, we're gonna say that, we're one of the vendors, but look around, we're not the only people uh, in town. Um, and I think there's a lot of evidence and data to suggest why it's no, it's no longer an optional uh, part of a learning strategy. Secondly, and probably a little bit less time on this, was sort of why L&D teams may struggle uh, on their own. You know, whether that be pressure of time, resources, speed, agility, a number of different factors. And then try and conclude with some sort of practical steps uh, to help you on your way if you're not already there or get reassurance if you're already doing a fantastic job. So firstly, for those that don't know, um, Fosway, who are here today, you know, Europe's number one analyst. Um, we do, we've done a lot of work with them. Um, and we really wanted to go out and, and sort of engage the market to understand a couple of things. But who we went to, predominantly European uh, L&D teams, about 70% of the people surveyed were in Europe, um, but also we're a global business, so a bit in APAC and Americas. Um, and about 70% of respondents were in organizations under 2,000 employees. So just so sort of, if you think that the data that we share doesn't sound like your organization, uh, that's sort of wh where that's come from. Um, and more results and insights can be downloaded later on or come and see us in the stand. So kind of quick bit of context, like why did we want to do this? Um, I think we, it's obvious to say that individuals, teams and organisations have never been under so much pressure to learn and adapt. Um, I'm, I, there's been a lot more written around uh, the world of work that's changing, but it continues to drive more problems, whether you know, post-pandemic organisations facing challenges on demographics or skill shortages, growing expectations around flexibilities, changing working environments, as well as some of the growing issues around sustainability, diversity, etc. Uh, and ultimately the pace of digital transformation continues to accelerate. I think some of the stats I've seen that the pandemic's accelerated that four or five times. Um, and in response to that, learning teams are having to embrace digital learning you know, like never before. Um, whilst recognising there's a number of organisations, you may well be some of them who have used digital learning in some form for decades, um, a lot of other organisations uh, have having to adapt and adopt it for the first time over the last 18 months or so. so Forgive some of the commentary, it feels a little bit um, you know, pandemic-esque, but that was really when a, a research was produced. I know a lot of people are coming out the other side now, but I think it's, it was important for us to try and understand um, how do you develop a content strategy and what's changed? So I'm not gonna go through all of the questions there, but these were some of the things that we wanted to understand. So why are people using content? What are they using that for? Where's it working, where's it not? Um, what are some of the other areas on there? What, what, how do you maximise the value on it? We'll talk a little bit less about that today, but the research will talk about, bit, about that. Interestingly, you know, when do you buy, when do you build, when do you integrate, when do you blend? You know, there's a lot of in, insight, or hopefully some relevant insight, of how you do that. So it was sort of, we attempted to, to sort of get the insight from the market, but also feed that back into the market. We work with a lot of content partners, so how can we help them develop better content to sort of serve the needs of our customers? So, what, what did it tell us? Um, well, the first thing, um, and I, I've got quite a few graphs here that I've been coached to take my time and introduce them first, because uh, the expert that would have done some of this couldn't be here today, so you've got me instead. Um, but the first thing that was really obvious and sort of um, perhaps interesting was when we asked, what problem is digital learning trying to solve? And I was at the uh, LPI's Learning Live event a few weeks ago where they surveyed all of the uh, CLO, top CLO challenges, and actually a lot of the top five challenges are represented here. So how do organizations enable a dispersed workforce? You know, how do you scale learning? How do you enable a learning culture? So what was, was sort of very evident um, 
maybe interesting, maybe obvious, maybe new to some people, was that actually there's a number of different reasons now why people are having to adopt some form of digital content. Um, and actually that reflects a lot of what are the typical, hopefully some nodding heads, challenges that you may have either solved in your business for some of you, or maybe still facing. So as interesting as what it does solve and why do it, I think was, you know, it says on the right hand side there, cost is one of the least uh, important reasons of why people are adopting it. So what this graph uh, represents, we asked everybody what were the problems digital learning is trying to solve. People can answer multiple answers. Uh, I will be able to share the slides as well should you want some more information, but please, please feel free to take pictures anyway. Um, so we asked people to rank it first, second, uh, all the way down to eight. So really when we look at sort of the first and second category, how you can see how the biggest driver, and, and really the previous slide summarized this, how it's about a diverse workforce and scaling learning. But perhaps what was most interesting, and maybe we just haven't checked for a while, how, how little it was about implementing for cost savings. Certainly, you know, 10 years ago, perhaps, e-learning or digital learning, as it's now been rebranded, was, was sort of a primary driver to sort of reduce cost. Um, but again, interestingly, you know, there's a number of different drivers, and certainly when we spend time talking to customers, that's one of the things I work with my teams on, to understand why are you really trying to do this? And it's not the, some of the obvious reasons around the topics. There may be some, some bigger business challenges that are trying to be addressed. Um, the second one was sort of, the, the sort of the, uh, I guess, a, a, another reflection of sort of the main drivers. And um, again, you know, a change in the last few years, you know, it's not all about compliance. And again, we see with our clients, you know, about 70% of the content consumed within the portals is more self-led uh, and sort of learner-led rather than compliance-driven content. So, you, you know, it's... You can't move anywhere in the industry at the moment without hearing the topic of skills. It's the sort of the, the new economy, um, but, 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 but a number of other areas, as I said, a label, a learning culture, growth mindset, you know, health and safety. So still very much compliance driven, but a, a much more uh, varied range of drivers that are, um, are asking us to sort of invest in the content, which makes it harder, whether that be different types of vendors that you have to choose, different delivery mechanisms, what's the right blend. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was the sort of second interesting part. And when we dig deeper on skills, uh, and again, there's sort of more data on this, um, it's not just some of the typical skills that you might have expected. So again, generically, you know, technology, compliance-driven skills have been a sort of easy route in for some of the digital learning content. But what we're seeing now is that sort of everywhere in the organization is getting access or is, is using access for digital content. You know, if, if you're in your organization and there's not change going on, then you know, there's going to be some significant challenge, I would suggest, in your organization or operational change, leadership and management, you know, it's number one skill and capability that organizations are trying to develop. So there's not an area that doesn't, digital learning doesn't, doesn't touch. And then secondly, uh, again, perhaps slightly more obvious, um, and the data really suggested is that more than ever, we're having to deliver the content to where people need it, whether that be home, work, in the field, uh, and on different devices. Um, so sort of more pressure to deliver that. And certainly, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone you know, naturally panicked, tried to convert everything to virtual. That didn't work necessarily. So having to find what, what is the right blend but this isn't going to go away. You know, in our own organization, when we're trying to deliver learning, you know, we have a hybrid workforce and we're having to think differently, like I'm sure all of you are having to do. So this was reassuring, but also insightful at the same time. And, and so one of the final points was, was really um, recognizing, you know, we in the off the shelf content business, it's one of many solutions, recognizing it's part of the fabric of the L&D solution, whether it be face to face, bespoke, uh, curated, wh whatever format you like, but actually uh, the sort of the mentality of sort of build it and they will come with a standalone catalogue is, is sort of a thing of the past, you know, and, and more and more now organisations, we're saying here, you know, near, uh, over 60% of organisations are using it as part of a blend. Um, and actually, as we'll come on to a little bit later, seeing, you know, where do you use a blend, where do you use off the shelf content for different types, uh, different parts of your organisation. Um, but increasingly it's used in more and more places. I think the other part that's not on here, which we touched on around engagement, you know, the least effective way of driving engagement in content has been proved to be 
uh, self-curated um, you know, a library and sort of build it and they will come. And it's evidence that that is now not the way to drive engagement. Whereas in fact the top way to drive engagement is through sort of peer-to-peer -peer recommendations and that's not a, um, you know, a direct, I like this, therefore you should do. And we'll come on to that when we talk a little bit about some of the learning experiences. But I think it's just recognizing when do you use relevant content and types of content to serve the particular audience. And the last piece of the data that I think sort of backs up the argument was that in, in, in a world where organizations are being pressured um, for resources or funds, you know, still 41% of teams expecting to increase investment in learning technology. So all the vendors in this room are very excited by that. Um, but also in the digital learning, in the content space, 66% of respondents looking to increase their spend. Um, perhaps when other areas of the business are are having budgets cut. So I think the old phrase of sort of, you know, at hard times, marketing and learning gets cut, I think is a thing of the past. I think it's a, a critical agenda that you have to continue to invest in. So I feel like I've whizzed through them faster than I would have done. But I think just to sort of summarize, you know, the, the sort of we posed the question and, and the research will do a much more eloquent job of describing this than I've done, but um, talks about why this is a non-negotiable part of your learning strategy. So when we think about, um, you know, learning needs to reach more people in a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a more diverse and hybrid workforce. The skills and the changing landscape of skills continues to drive the need to do that quicker, faster, be more, more, more agile, and it's not just about compliance. The range of skills is growing. Um, you're having to reach people where they need it, whether that be uh, in the technology or at the point of need of work. Um, and no longer a standalone solution, but as part of an integrated offering. So, and then sort of finally, you know, in the time of scrutiny, you know, people are looking to spend more. So I would love to hear uh, sort of opinions on that or whether people believe that to be true, but it sort of, it certainly feels pretty non-negotiable to me as part of an organization's uh, wider learning strategy. So that's, that's really the sort of, a snippet of context of the sort of why and what the research has told us. And then I just wanted to, to spend a bit of time unpacking what we believe some sort of best practice steps are of given all of that, and again, I feel like I've whizzed through that, but there's a lot of information to, di to dissect. But ha so what, like what do I do with that? How do I now do a better job of implementing a content strategy and how do we go about that? So just before I do that, uh, this, this slide, uh, as I sort of alluded to earlier, talking about where, which type of content is used. So the orange uh, boxes are where people are using off-the-shelf content. The blue is bespoke and the yellow is user-generated. So what we've certainly seen is, a, is an increased trend of user-generated content serving organizations. So perhaps the typical view that you might have expected is, your own business products, products and services, depending on what organization you're part of. Traditionally, that is worth investing in bespoke content. It's gonna be unique to you. Perhaps you've got the, the teams of people that can invest in that and, and sort of adapt to that quicker. Versus technology, uh, as an extreme example, the pace of technology is changing so much that it's unlikely within your organization you'll have the skills to continually update bespoke content or user-generated content. So, People are investing more in off-the-shelf content, trusting the experts perhaps who are investing in that product roadmap. And, and you sort of see the shift uh, from, from, from one way or another. Whereas, you know, again, leadership and management in the middle here probably got that blend. So depending on the size, scale, appetite of your L&D team or the sort of nuances of your particular culture, uh, whether or not that is worthwhile building something yourself or buying uh, expertise in externally. So let's get into um, some of the steps. So we're, again, working with Fosway, uh, have sort of shared some of the insights. I'm not gonna walk through all of these levels, you'll be pleased to know. Um, but I think firstly, like with any good um, analysis, it's understanding why, you know, why are we doing this and who are your audience? So you know, this model really represents uh, the maturity of, of, of the importance of L&D depending on the state of the organization. So down here, we're looking at very much operational delivery where it's all about compliance and efficiency of, of, of the roles and the skills versus at the other, other end, 
perhaps you're a financial services organization going through a complete transformation where you're having to reskill your whole organization. And the, the imperative is much more important, arguably, um, and, and therefore the experience that is required, both in terms of the learning content, style, audience, all of those things are going to be very different. So at a high level, you know, know your audience, know your stakeholders, uh, and understand the priorities. And that, again, might sound obvious, but then when you get in underneath the sort of the specific need, and again, we've talked about this quite a lot, you know, where's the, what's the data telling you? If you're lucky enough to have an organization that is, uh, has the right data available to you, how are you using that data to determine, is this really the thing, the need, the requirement that, that the organization is telling you to, telling you that they have the challenge for? So after the who, uh, the sort of the why, it's sort of what and who. So again, th this is sort of another way of representing the different uh, audiences and the context of the audiences that you're looking to deliver learning in. So perhaps if you're looking at operational performance training or experiences, it's about I need impact now. So I need somebody to do something today and then tomorrow I need them to implement that skill or that behavior. So what's the right way to deliver that? It might be bite-sized learning. There might be some things that you need to provide outside of the learning solution itself. Um, you know, there's certainly going to need performance management tools to be able to help measure whether that's been executed. When you look in the middle, perhaps it's a sort of slightly longer term view. You know, strategic talent management. How are you thinking about job roles and families? So these are absolutely not part of a sort of a content component, but it's an important to understand where you're delivering the content or the learning solution of the program who's the audience and how does that need to be designed differently in order to address the particular needs and on the far end perhaps more of the sort of aspirational learning culture where you're offering certain solutions to uh, employees over and above the um, the requirements of the job today so it might be part of a uh, em employee value proposition or it might just be the experience for that particular audience that you want to deliver so take the time to understand what you're trying to do and who's that for the third part of the jigsaw is sort of how do we get people hooked on learning and, and again not not to sort of confuse that with sort of unnecessary consumption but by getting people motivated with a particular learning experience again the Fosway diagram here brings together you know, sort of a myriad of, of things to consider about how to do that. Um, but also start to think about outside of the learning experience them itself, how can, all, how, how can individuals develop that skill and that knowledge with sort of work touch, touch points and uh, immersive experience sort of on, on and off the job or working with others in different functions to enable them to, to sort of realize the potential of what they're being taught. There's a quote here that was from a recent LinkedIn survey about how they're really driving better employee retention um, by creating great experiences and giving people opportunities to work in different parts of the organizations that might be outside of delivering a learning solution that is you know, designed to uh, uh, hit a particular button or a particular need for today. So with that said, I, I sort of will we'll refer back to one of the pieces of insights again. So this is what we are all or, or all aspiring to, but actually the research shows that whilst organizations have got, and again this diagram, we're talking about how advanced is the technology or uh, how advanced is your use of the technology, it's probably more helpful. Lots of vendors with lots of different ways of solving similar problems, whether that be a learning portal or, or you know, chatbots, whatever that might be. And then people reflecting on, well, I've bought this technology, I've got this solution. Actually, how much is that helping me achieve the experience that I'm trying to get to? And perhaps rather alarmingly, less than 15% of people with portals or LXPs are, are saying that they're sort of really leveraging the power of that to produce the experience that they were expecting. So when we go back to sort of think about how do we create that experience, I think it's about thinking about what is the right platform, technology, experience that you want to create for those specific individuals. And the final part of that um, is, you know, considering the sort of human element of learning. So how do we, again, this is about the experience itself. Do we want someone to have a fun experience, engaging? Well, what, what are the dynamics that need to place? Where do we want them to take that learning? Um, how do we want them to share it? Who do they want to deliver that with or experience that program with? 
um, and then considering the sort of agility of that delivery. So you know, on the right there, so what are the inputs? How are we going to action that? How do we continue to refine that as the sort of ch the, the needs of the business are changing and perhaps the content requirements of that particular solution uh, is also changing? So in summary, there's sort of four key steps as, as, as sort of we see it and happy to share these in more detail, but it's, you know, firstly, how do we better understand the value and the sort of why? Then the sort of what and the who, so who do we need to deliver? Where are they gonna be for this? And then, you know, what is the right solution? And, you know, digital learning is one of many, as I've said. And then ultimately, what sort of energy are we looking to create as part of that experience to keep people you know, motivated and wanting to come back uh, to experience more of the programs that you put together? Um, so I have feel, feel like I've rattled through that quicker than planned, but um, uh, if you wanted to hear more about uh, the research, then you've got the QR code here um, to be able to download the white paper. Come and see us at Stand 38. Happy to um, take any questions or thoughts around that. Um, just leave that up for a minute for those that are doing that. <clears throat> going once, going twice. Um, if you'd like to listen to um, David Perrin, who, who sort of we work with closely at Fosway uh, on this research, and we'll go into far more detail than I would around some of the topics and some of the trends we're seeing from there, then uh, we are having a webinar with him uh, uh, at the end of the month. So please uh, join the conversation at our events page. Uh, we'd love to see you there. We'd love to sort of hear your opinions on that. Um, and I'm happy to, to try and take any questions, although I can't hear much. But uh, if you wanted to uh, stay around afterwards, I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have. But thank you for taking the time to listen to me this afternoon.